everybody. Um, I hope that you all can see and hear me. Uh, so welcome to the special session. Uh, and uh, well, I will start from introducing myself. So my name is Przemysław Marciniak. I'm a Byzantinist from the University of Silesia in Katowice, Poland. And I'm working, among other things, on the reception of Byzantium in popular culture. So, and this is why I'm so glad that I have both the honor and opportunity to introduce Chrisa Sakel and Spiros Theoharis. And uh, you are with us, right? Because I should have asked at the very beginning. Hello? I'm here. I'm Chrisa Sakel. Uh, okay, great. I was Am I allowed to unmute myself? Here. I don't know. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Good, great. No, okay. can, I, I will continue. I was just uh, making sure that you're. Uh, you're with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Krisa and, and Spiros are people responsible for creating the graphic novel uh, titled Theophano, which unsurprisingly is about the Empress Theophano. Uh, the most famous Polish Byzantine play uh, is also about her. So this is why I'm even more excited. So uh, I was even more excited to read uh, their story. Uh, I see their, their graphic novel, Theophano, uh, which I enjoy, I have to say, I enjoyed very much as an element of a broader trend uh, of incorporating uh, Byzantium into the mainstream popular culture. Uh, uh, similarly to graphic novel, Dieni Sacritas, uh, or, the, or the novels, uh, or, uh, or a novel about the Byzantine zombies. So uh, as I have learned from the internet, Chrisa started painting when she was five. Uh, she then turned to digital painting, and Theophano is her first project. Uh, Spiros is an English literature graduate, fascinated by Greek mythology, uh, Tolkien, and Byzantine history. Uh, and the graphic novel is already attracting attention, uh, attention as interviews in various media outlets show they were interviewed by, 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 by Anthony Caldelli, for instance. Uh, as I understand, the Greek version preceded the English version, uh, and I hope the other translations will follow. And when I ask them uh, what they want me to say about them, they modestly answered that I should just underscore the fact that this is their debut and they hope to continue the project in the future. Uh, so on the comicsology page, uh, I've read that this is, uh, I mean, I, I have no idea whether this was Spiro's idea or not, but I liked it a lot. I've read that this is a Cinderella story which has gone horribly wrong. Uh, so uh, let's hear from the authors how their version turned into a success story. But before uh, you, before you uh, will take on, I, I just wanted to remind you all to mute your mics, and then you can post your questions uh, even during presentations so we can start uh, immediately. So, uh, Chrisa Spiros, the virtual floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me begin first. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us. Uh, we feel especially honored to participate in such an event because as we said, we are not academics or none of us has any degree in uh, Byzantine studies at all. Uh, I am Spiros Theoharis and I am the writer of the dialogues and uh, the writer of the script of the graphic novel. Uh, I would characterize myself as a Roman history enthusiast and a comic book geek, I would say. Um, we came up uh, with a story about the Byzantine Empire, uh, taking into account uh, its, uh, little, uh, its little media um, exposure, I would say, uh, compared to other contemporary medieval cultures that existed during the same time. Um, I'm a fan of uh, medieval fiction series and movies which have been recently released on TV and cinema. We all know about them. I don't need to uh, name them. Um, this gave me the inspiration to write a small script for a Byzantine story which would be adapted to a comic book, a medium which is closely linked to what we call pop culture um, and is more understandable by younger generations, I would say. In order to do this, uh, I had to thoroughly look into primary sources and academic publications related to the 10th century Byzantium and also the story of uh, Theophano. Um, some of uh, my sources were uh, Scilidzis, Leo the Deacon, uh, the Ceremonies, some excerpts that I could find in English from Yahya of Antioch and some also non-contemporary sources, mainly for the architectural and ceremonial details. For example, one that I could uh, remember now, it's uh, from Antony of Novgorod, which is not actually 
from the 10th century, but it really helped us a lot, especially Chris Xavier. Um, apart uh, from the scarcity of reliable descriptions of buildings and clothes, uh, the accounts of Theophano are quite controversial as well, and this helped me also uh, fictionalize as much as possible the story. So let me just make a small summary of the story. Uh, Theophano um, is a partly fictional story, as I said, of a common girl uh, from Sparta, uh, from Laconia, as the sources say, uh, who becomes the wife of two emperors and mother of two more. Um, although the plot follows and accepted by a bibliography historical course, some of the events happening in it unfold according to my own uh, interpretation of the primary sources. Um, this happens mostly in order to keep uh, Theophano the protagonist and also a central figure within the plot. Um, Theophano gets born in Constantinople during the reign of uh, co-emperor Romanos Lecapinos. Um, after she grows up, an, an, an unexpected event uh, in her father's tavern marks the beginning of her relationship with the co-emperor Romanos. This Romanos is actually the son of the senior emperor Constantine VII. Uh, also known as uh, Porphyrogenitus, or born in the purple. Uh, Theophano marries uh, Romanos, enters the palace, and this is where she discovers a whole new world of intrigue and political antagonism. She gets to understand uh, the role uh, that the palace eunuchs play uh, from the actions of uh, Joseph Bringas and uh, Basil Lecapinos. And also how women um, can influence uh, the imperial authority uh, through the actions uh, of her mother-in-law, uh, Helena Lecapini, who is actually the daughter of, the, um, of um, a previous emperor called uh, Romanos Lecapinos as well. Um, as we all know from history, um, Theophano gives birth to three heirs, uh, Basil, Constantine and Anna. Uh, from that point on, within the plot, Theophano's ambitions and motives are closely linked to these children. Uh, Basil actually gets baptized by the powerful land magnet and general of the Eastern armies, Nikiforos Phokas, and this event introduces a political relationship between Nikiforos and Theophano that will eventually end up into a marital relationship after the mysterious uh, deaths of Emperor Constantine and later of Emperor Romanos, who is her, who is her husband. Uh, this alliance of Theophano and Nikiforos Phokas eventually doesn't end well, as we know, leading to the climax of the story with the events at the Bukoleon Palace and the involvement of General John Tsimiskis, uh, who is actually the nephew of Nikiforos Phokas, and whose relationship with Theophano paves the way to the throne of the Imperial Palace. Sorry. Um, what else to say? Ah, um, it, uh, about Theophano now, it wasn't my intention to make a hero out of her, nor to show how uh, strong women could become during that time. Um, I really understand that um, it was the Middle Ages and women had some limitations on the role they could play in medieval politics. Uh, there are, of course, some exceptions that come to my mind, for example, like Empress Irene of Athens. Uh, but uh, Theophano had, uh, I could say, by no means uh, this kind of power. In most cases, she reacts in a spontaneous manner, uh, reflecting her lack of proper imperial upbringing, but also um, her understanding that survival in the palace means that she's going to, uh, to use whatever means a woman can employ uh, within a medieval setting in order to be able to uh, stay in power. Uh, now, if anyone uh, wonders why Theophano and not somebody more historically famous, because we have been asked a lot about this, I think this has to do also with the era that we wanted to depict. So apart from the obvious interest that the story of medieval politics uh, could attract, uh, the era during which uh, this story takes place uh, marks the beginning of a cultural and territorial resurgence of the medieval uh, Roman Empire, uh, which is otherwise called the Macedonian Renaissance. Um, Theophano within the story witnesses an era of four successive emperors and gives birth to the one who will be benefited from all this effort and will rule an empire that reaches its historical peak eventually. And through the comic book medium, uh, we had the opportunity to show how the Byzantine world may have looked like to an audience 
which is not so familiar or is a bit um, biased uh, towards uh, the history and culture of uh, the medieval Romans. So we intended to show that the Byzantines considered themselves as Romans and uh, that many of their um, customs and uh, uh, cultural features reflected this claim of identity. So I think Chrisa will talk more about the artistic aspect uh, right now after me. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you uh, for the introduction. My name is uh, Chrisavisa Kilaropoulou. Uh, I use the shortened version Chrisa Sakel as a nickname in the book and in my social media. Uh, as uh, the host said uh, before, it is my first, uh, Theofano is my first attempt uh, in creating an illustrated book. I have been uh, taking art classes since I was uh, very young and um, I, have, I don't have any uh, degree related to Byzantium. Uh, in fact, I have studied chemistry, but uh, I learned a lot about uh, the Byzantine uh, history through the whole process or who, uh, the whole creation process. Uh, I have prepared a small presentation to give you some uh, samples of uh, the artwork and give you an idea of uh, what uh, the book looks like. So the first, uh, yes, the fir in the first slide, you can see the cover of the book. Uh, in the end of the presentation, I will show you where you can find more information about it. Uh, I said uh, that the whole creation process was very, something very challenging for me because uh, there were so many things uh, that I had to imagine and put down to paper. And I had no, not very many visual uh, um, references. And it was our goal to uh, imagine and draw uh, things uh, in important elements that we found in our research, uh, which because we haven't seen uh, something similar done before in other forms of art, uh, it was very difficult uh, to imagine famous characters, buildings and ceremonies and to imagine what clothes would look like back then or how people would stand. Uh, first of all, uh, the characters uh, that uh, we imagined, uh, they were designed according to the historical representations we found of them. Uh, we studied um, their age and their behavior and their status in the palace. And we also studied different mosaics uh, that depicted people from the palace and the court of that time. And uh, we used uh, images from coins and uh, some relics that still survive in various museums around the world. Uh, for me, uh, building interiors was the most challenging part because a few samples of uh, that time's architecture remain up to today. And those of them that still do, uh, they have been modified several times since the day they were built. So I had to rely completely on some historical texts, some written descriptions, and um, add my imaginations on them. Uh, on this slide, you can see the throne room, uh, which is located in the palace of Magnavra, and it contains the, um, the throne of Solomon and the famous mechanical golden lions and singing birds. So it was something we definitely wanted to include uh, in the graphic novel. In this uh, slide, uh, you can see the Haki Gate, uh, which was a famous part of the palace in the, of the 10th century. Uh, you can see the golden tiles I added and uh, the famous uh, icon of Christ on top of uh, the gate. And uh, in the next slide, I added uh, to show uh, this to show you the whole setting of the hypodrome. And in the back, you can see Hagia Sophia and the Augustean. Um, this is the Church of the Holy Apostles. Uh, we wanted to include it in the graphic novel because it was the second most important uh, church of the empire and also the Imperial Mausoleum. Um, we based uh, the design of the San Marcos uh, Cathedral in Venice uh, because we find, found in the sources that uh, 
the architecture of St. Mark's Cathedral was in, inspired by its design. Um, and here is uh, the famous Bucoleon Palace. And it, it was a very important building of that time. And uh, it's some, some of its ruins still remain uh, in Constantinople, in Istanbul. And uh, we found many representations of how it would look like from different artists. And this is my representation of it. In the back, you can see uh, the, the huge statue of a lion fighting a boar. Um, now I wanted to talk a bit about the ceremonies because we may, had uh, a lot of we made a lot of research about what different ceremonies would look like and what was the process and how some settings would look like. Um, this is an example of the ceremonial triumph of Nicephorus Focas. And uh, in the next uh, slide, uh, it is the crowning scene of uh, Emperor Romanos and uh, Empress Theophano. And you can see uh, the interior of Hagia Sophia. We wanted to represent uh, all the parts that still don't, that don't exist up to today. And um, we changed a little bit the facts here because uh, we knew that the crowning of the emperor was uh, located uh, in Hagia Sophia, but uh, the empress would be crowned in a different church. So, but we changed that fact because we wanted to show, we thought it would look better like that. And we wanted to show this image. And uh, I added this uh, slide because I wanted to show how we uh, used different, uh, uh, different uh, information we found in our research. Uh, this is a wall mural that uh, we, it can be still found today in uh, the church of Nicephorus Focas in a small village uh, in Cappadocia called Cavusin. And it is, as far as we know, the only wall mural that depicts Theophano. She's standing next to Nicephorus Focas, and also you can see Leo Focas standing a bit further on her left. In this, uh, in this slide, in the next slide, you can see on the left, Basil uh, Le Capinos, the eunuch, talking to John Chimiskis on the right. And uh, we knew that uh, Basil Le Capinos was the commissioner of many works of art. Uh, so we wanted to include one of his most famous uh, pieces of art that he commissioned, uh, which is the Stavrotech of Limburg. Finally, I added this uh, photo because uh, we found uh, in our research that uh, this is, there uh, is a coin that uh, you can find in uh, the Byzantine collection of Dumbarton Nox, and it depicts Theophano. And we are uh, very honored, very thankful for that they gave us uh, their permission to add it in our graphic novel. So, uh, I just wanted to give you an idea through this presentation of how this uh, book looks like and what, uh, how, what we did to um, visualize all the information and include all the interesting information we found. Uh, because I think that uh, this is the element that uh, makes the whole um, project stand out. And uh, I think it's a very um, interesting experience for everyone who is interested in Byzantium to go through this book. And uh, if you want to know any more information, this is our website uh, where you can uh, also see more things about it and maybe read uh, the blog that Spears to Harris writes occasionally. And uh, thank you again for your, um, your attention and I will be glad to answer all your questions about the artwork and the 